May 2nd, 1863. As the day begins, Confederate Generals Robert E. Lee and Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson meet for the last time to discuss their audacious plan to divide their forces and attack a numerically superior enemy at Chancellorsville, a small crossroads west of Fredericksburg, Virginia. Jackson attacks and crushes the enemy flank. Darkness falls, but Jackson wants to continue the attack. He rides forward to reconnoiter enemy lines. As his party returns to his own lines, Confederate troops mistake them for the enemy and open fire. Two musket balls strike Jackson in his left arm, one of them shattering the bone. A third ball lodges in his right hand. A surgeon amputates his left arm, but a few days later, pneumonia sets in. At 3.15 p.m. on May 10, 1863, Stonewall Jackson dies. Stonewall Jackson's death was still very much a fresh memory when the museum was founded in 1890, which was, after all, only 27 years after the event. Stonewall Jackson was not only a military hero, he was a Christian hero, a man who exemplified Christian virtues, and he was venerated for both reasons. The museum received many objects, relics really would be a better term, relating to his wounding and his death and his commemoration, the event that one historian described as the Confederacy's Passion Play. The volley that wounded Stonewall Jackson killed his engineering officer, Captain James Keith Boswell. The bullet passed through Boswell's field notebook first. Another of Jackson's staff members was aide-de-camp James Powers Smith. He was not in the reconnoitering party, but he reached Jackson's side minutes later and helped carry him to safety. Smith later donated to the museum the shell jacket he wore that night, reportedly still showing faint bloodstains on the cuffs. Another critical player in this drama was Dr. Hunter Holmes McGuire, who was Jackson's chief medical director. McGuire arrived at the scene and removed the hastily applied bandages, including this sparsely blood-stained handkerchief, and he investigated the wound and decided that the arm must come off. He performed the amputation at a field hospital near Wilderness Tavern. McGuire, like Smith, was involved with the museum in its earliest years, and he donated to the museum buttons and insignia from Jackson's uniform frock coat. The coat apparently has not survived, but the museum received several small pieces of fabric said to have been from the coat that Jackson wore when he was wounded. Jackson died on May 10th at 3.15 p.m. in the Chandler Plantation office at Guinea Station between Richmond and Fredericksburg. The first news received of Jackson's death in Richmond was in the form of this telegram that James Power Smith sent to his sister. Well, perhaps the most significant artifact in the museum's collection relating to Jackson's death, and certainly the biggest, is this flag that draped his coffin when it lay in state in the Virginia and the Confederate Capitol building on May 12, 1863. It was intended to fly over the Capitol itself, the first example of the new second national flag, but was used on Jackson's coffin instead. Instead of burying her husband in Richmond, Marianna Jackson decided to have his body transported to their adopted home city of Lexington, Virginia. Rosser Rock, a 15-year-old cadet at the Virginia Military Institute, witnessed the arrival of Jackson's body in Lexington. Then he was one of the three cadets chosen to stand guard over the casket overnight. Words are inadequate to express my feelings as I walk my post around his coffin, Rock wrote to his sister. Enclosed, I send you a piece of arbor vitae that I got off his coffin about 12 o'clock Thursday night while in the room alone with the corpse. Rock was hardly alone. Others collected flowers from the casket as it lay in state in Richmond or in Lexington and donated those to the museum, sometimes with their own poignant stories. Jackson's gravesite at Lexington's Presbyterian Cemetery became a pilgrimage site for mourners. Even those who never saw the casket or Jackson's gravesite mourned Stonewall Jackson. Then there is this curious acorn. It's a souvenir from a royal polonia tree, the roots of which supposedly grew to surround Jackson's remains inside his coffin. Jackson's life immediately became the subject of biographies, sermons, sheet music, poetry, and even children's stories. Jackson's admirers took immediate steps to commemorate him in even more permanent forms. 
Upon learning of his death, English admirers began raising funds for a monument. Twelve years later, and ten years after the Confederacy's collapse, their statue was dedicated in Richmond's Capitol Square. For decades after his death, Jackson continued to be the subject of popular prints, sheet music, and other printed ephemera. One of the keepers of the Stonewall Jackson flame in the half century after his death was former staff officer Captain James Power Smith. He became a Presbyterian minister, was honorary chaplain for the museum, and lived until 1923. Fifty years to the day after Jackson's death, Smith appealed to Richmonders to erect a statue to Jackson on Monument Avenue. Six years later, the equestrian monument was dedicated, but not without controversy. The inscription on the base of the monument says that Jackson was killed at Chancellorsville. The museum's parent organization protested that the inscription was untrue to history, which it is. The work of modern historians even challenges the contention that Jackson was mortally wounded at Chancellorsville because he didn't die as a direct result of his wounds. Even 150 years later, Stonewall Jackson's life, the circumstances of his death, and the question of how events might have been different had he not been shot at Chancellorsville remain subjects of fascination, study, and animated discussion.